Hello, everybody. I, this is Cami, um, trying to be technically apt. Um, from Fiber Art Now, this is uh, our, trying to do as many uh, uh, interviews with our creative community so we can. Um, we're hearing strange noises in the back. I'm not sure why. But bear with me as we go through um, uh, this interview with, uh, with Lindsay Gates. Um, from Peters Valley uh, School of Craft and uh, Stuart Kestenbaum from Haystack. Well, nope, you're no longer at Haystack, uh, but now you're working with our, our wonderful people at uh, Social Impact and representing the craft school. So I'm looking forward to hearing, um, having you share all that information with us. And if anybody is having technical difficulties, we say just go out and come back in. And please, by all means, type in uh, you know, your name, where, where you're checking in from, because it's really nice to see that people are um, signing in from various parts of the country, the world. As I was saying, our rug hookers, man, they were from uh, down under up to Nova Scotia. So we really had a wild time with rug hookers a couple weeks ago. OK, so. Um, Let's see, where to begin? I want to make sure um, that we start with the power of taking uh, workshops that we have a variety of craft schools across the country, but today we're going to focus on um, five of those. Um, so why don't we start with Lindsay? And Lindsay, why don't you give me an idea or tell our, our community um, what's what is the impact that a craft school experience has? Because you really can speak to it because you started there in the heart of it and okay. evolved over years. So um, let me know. Let us know about that. Well, it uh, profoundly changed my life to have a craft school experience uh, about 20 years ago <laughs> when I was <laughs> leaving college. Um, I had the chance to come and do a summer residency at Peters Valley and it really opened my eyes to what was possible in the field. Um, here we have you know new instructors coming in every week and they're all professionals in their field who have found a way to make a living, make a career in the arts and as a a young artist, I was the beneficiary of being able to meet them and work with them for the week or two that they were here and really absorb all of that knowledge. And I took that and was able to kind of craft my own career um, with the advice and the guidance and, you know, all of those contacts that I was able to make. Um, so it was really, it, it changed the entire uh, direction of or it really guided me um, in a direction that I was already interested in and eventually um, became such a profound uh, experience as far as learning about these schools and going to Penland and going to Haystack and, and going to all these places that I eventually went back and actually studied art administration to help um, to help further these these educational opportunities. Oh, that's that's interesting. Um, I know uh, if you go to the Fiber Art Now uh, website, we have a, a lovely blog um, about your journey, and um, and and now you're working in what capacity? For so now the, I work as the development director here. Um, we have a real interest in connecting artists to opportunities and keep keeping people connected to the school um, and promoting special events and special opportunities um, as well as raising money which is part of the development right that's a full-time full-time job um, well let's just let's click in Stuart here can you hear me we've had I a little can. audio difficulties here so uh, bear with us but dude why don't you uh, you've also had a very extensive, long, and, and splendid journey with uh, Haystack and the craft, the compassion to keep the craft uh, endeavor alive. 
Why don't you yeah. give me yeah, a little bit about that? And, uh, you know, I can't, I could only read Lindsay's lips, so I mean, if I repeat anything, just make a gesture, like if I start to tell her story instead of mine, or, but, uh, you know, I first, uh, I first I came to Haystack, I was a student at, in the ceramics workshop, and I'd been an apprentice to a potter, uh, and when I was finishing my apprenticeship, he said, you know, you should go to a place like Haystack or Penland, and I was living in Maine at the time, so I went to Haystack, and I was there for a three-week workshop. And because the workshops at that time were three weeks long, and uh, I had the most remarkable time because I was in a community of makers. I was in a place where everybody supported uh, working on your art, and you didn't have to think about anything else except for that. Mm. And uh, it's a very transformational kind of power because I think people go because, in my case, it was time for me to go, and I went. Uh, and people go at different times for different reasons, but I think there's a moment where you know, it seems like that's the thing you want to study, the thing you want to try. Uh, and I think it gives you a kind of gift of time that you can work for mm -hmm. as long as you want and you're supported in what you work in. The communities at the schools are not hierarchical. Uh, so you're equal with everybody who's there and you could be having a meal with the teacher. You could be talking to people who are from very backgrounds from different countries and you just get a sense of where you are in this world of makers. And I think that's really the uh, enormous uh, power to the places. So what, what kind of uh, people do you find, I'll start with Stu, <laughs> uh, what kind of people do you find uh, are the regulars or is it new people? Can you give us a, a vision of, of what kind sure. of people? I'm going to start clicking around on these pictures that Victoria is showing so we can share them. Yeah, well, you know, uh, last year at, at Haystack, and I think this would be pretty typical for all the schools, we had students from uh, 45 states and 19 countries. Wow. Our, our youngest student in the summer, because of our liability issues, that you have to be 18. So in, in case of Haystack, you have to be 18. Our oldest student was 92. We had people from high school students who just graduated who wanted to try to work uh, more in depth with their craft. We have people who are in graduate school, undergraduates. We have professionals who come back perhaps to take a workshop in another medium. Mm -hmm. So we've had furniture makers take basketry courses, for example. People, uh, mm -hmm. And we've had people um, really from all around, the, all around the country and all different ages and from abroad as well. And I think uh, it always makes for a, a kind of unlikely mix that always, always makes sense that people find a way to communicate and because it's not one, uh, it's not saying graduate school where people might all be the same, close to the same age or have the same experiences, in this case you have to find a different kind of common language to speak in because you're coming from all different areas and I think that makes it a very egalitarian kind of place and, and nobody's, uh, there is no hierarchy and I think that's really the beauty of the places. Hmm. I hadn't thought of that. Um, Lindsay, do you want to Give us the bandwidth of what you've seen. Yeah, we have Type a similar of. demographic, and I think that a real strength of the schools is the diversity. Um, and that's not something that we are casual about. We really encourage that diversity um, through a robust scholarship program, which I know we're not the only ones that do that. Um, but we really find that that age diversity and uh, background diversity adds so much flavor to this unique way of learning um, that it's often what people mention in the surveys that, you know, it was so wonderful to have such a diverse uh, mm -hmm. class that they were studying with. And uh, we really, you know, try to celebrate that. Yeah, that's – that. Uh... That is good. I know you uh, were both uh, talking about how you have community events that happen throughout the year. Um, you have, uh, you know, the summer summer programs, but it just it doesn't stop there. You really try to engage people uh, all year round in and around the community. It sounds like. I will say that the the one common um, theme or back something that everybody shares who comes to these schools is that they're all lifelong learners. Mm -hmm. So they may not have the same skill set, they may not have the same background, they may not be even from the same country, but they're all interested in being 
in learning new things, whatever that may be. And so they already have a common language, um, which really starts a really great conversation. Yeah, that common language. I don't know. Stu, do you want to, are you able to hear about? Uh, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't hear that, but I, you give me a starting place. I'll go. The common language that uh, when they, when the students are there, they have that common language between them, no matter uh, where they're coming from, their background. Yes. Yeah, in fact, uh, you know, we have a program for high school kids that we've been doing for many, many years at Haystack called the Student Craft Institute. Kids come from all over the state of Maine, which is a very, uh, it's, it's a pretty big state for a state in the east. And, we, and one kid comes from each high school and about 70 different high schools all around the state, picked by their art teachers. And they may think they're the only person in the world who's like them. And they get to Haystack and they see that there's a world that's for them. They see that, that a whole, there's a whole place that's given over where creativity is at, at the heart of it. And, and it's a catalyst. Some of these kids have told me that they, because of that, they decided they were going to go to art school. They decided mm -hmm. to become an artist. They realized that they were possible. And, it's not, and I realize it's not just with kids that that happens, but when people get to a place, to, to one of the craft schools, they get there and, they, and I think they think, well, you know, I got this day job maybe, but this is really who I was meant to be. This is where I'm really working. These are, the, these are my people who are here. And, you know, it, you find your people everywhere and not just in our programs, but I think there's a certain moment where, where you, uh, you realize that there's a, you know, everybody's in it for that reason. They really want to get at the heart of understanding materials and making things. And, and that, that kind of community uh, lifts everybody. It lifts the teachers, it lifts the students. So, you know, for people who teach, like as Lindsay may have said this already, she's going to be teaching in Haystack this summer. Uh, you know, people who, who teach in the programs, I think it was buoyed, lifted up by that experience of being around people who really care about what they're doing. Nobody has to come to any place. So nobody's rolling their eyes saying, oh, i got to take this class. They're there because <laughs> they want to be. I'm and rolling that, my eyes because I can't. And that makes an enormous difference in terms of people uh, you know, it's a, a very pure kind of learning. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, on that vein, I, I want to talk, um, and maybe since you're on there, Stu, can you talk a little bit about the historical impact that craft schools have had, you know, for a very long time? Sure. Well, you know, the uh, really going back, uh, Penland started uh, is the, the oldest, or Aramont, I probably of the schools, but. But after World War II, I think there's a burgeoning interest in, in craft and lots of different ways of looking at materials, lots of people who, were, who went to uh, art school on the GI Bill. So a lot of people uh, out working at the time. And, you know, I think about the people who came through uh, programs like uh, at, our, at our schools, really uh, either as teachers or as students, just thinking at Haystack there was Annie Albers, Lenore Tani. Jack Larson, Arlene Fish, uh, who you may know as for her uh, amazing techniques in woven metals, took a weaving class when she was a, had just gotten out of, uh, she had just been teaching and she needed to teach weaving, so she took a weaving course at Haystack with Jack Larson. And as a result, began to work in textile techniques in, in metal. Wow. So a lot, there's lots of crossover, and I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Dale Chihuly uh, uh, taught at Haystack, did he? he was teaching at RISD, and, and okay. Fran Merritt, who was Haystack's founding director, invited him to teach at Haystack. He talked for four years consecutively, and mm -hmm. he was so impressed with Fran and what he'd done at Haystack that he started Pilchuck. Uh -huh. so, and, and Haystack was started because uh, uh, Mary Beeson Bishop, who was our founding angel, had been to, uh, Hayst to Penland as a student. Oh, and wow. So there's a lot of cross-fertilization. Okay. And then Bill Brown, who was Fran Merritt's director, uh, assistant director at, at Haystack, uh, for the first 10 years that Haystack was in existence, went to Penland and uh, became the director there, and he started the amazing residency program that, that Penland has. So there's lots of cross-fertilization between all the programs. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, as much as it is a catalyst for students who come, it is for teachers in terms of different techniques or things they'll try because there's a, it's a place where you can take a risk, where you can say, oh, I'm just here, I'm going to try this out. And I think that takes people to different places. That's true. Well, um, Lindsay, well, I want to 
uh, point out a comment we have from some from Kim Kimberly Becker on the side uh, over here, and she she says when when I would be leaving Haystack after a week or two, I would say oh, back to the real world, and Stuart would reply back, "This is the real world." <laughs> So, she sounds like that was those were good words, and uh, she's only. <laughs> um, Lindsay, do you uh, have any um, more to add about the historical impact craft uh, schools have made? Um, oh, I just second everything that Stu said, and I think right now um, we're also filling a void in schools as different departments are um, going out of business, uh, whether it's in a grade school or in a college, um, we're filling that gap now and offering opportunities that maybe are harder to come by these days. You were mentioning uh, when we were talking earlier about, um, or both of you were, about the resurgence of uh, weaving. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned that uh, you were the beneficiaries. I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit. Well, as colleges are cutting back on some of their programs, um, they're seeing us as a resource to help build our programs so that students who are still interested um, still have a way to access those materials, equipment, etc. cetera. Um, we recently just basically overhauled our weaving studio with beautiful equipment that was donated from a college who eliminated their weaving department. Um, and we just have people that are thirsty for that. And so now we can fill that void and we're proud to be able to bring in these amazing instructors to teach um, in our studio and you know have all of these guilds be interested in coming and helping us with the equipment. So. I think we're we're really filling a gap. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that's pretty exciting. I'm glad that there is a place for the the void to be filled. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the the group of you um, through social impact. Maybe I'm gonna pop over to uh, um, Stuart on this one. Um, I know Social Impact uh, and the five craft schools have a consortium of sorts. Do you want to talk about um, that happening? Sure. Well, we, uh, uh, the, the craft schools were in the, the project uh, began meeting uh, at, we had a meeting at the Southwest College of Art and Craft in San Antonio uh, probably four years ago, and it was a, it was a meeting of a number of, of programs and, and uh, and we all went around. We talked about our programs, what we did. But uh, you know, there's a certain affinity for our programs because we have very similar ways that we work. We're uh, intensive residential programs, and and we began just to talk and about the idea we might be able to do some marketing together. Uh, and that that spawned a number of conversations and and ways that we might do it. And 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 it quickly, I think, went beyond the idea of advertising. Uh, and we weren't after a market that already knew about us. We were just realized that, that there were so many people, so many kinds of people, creative people who could benefit from our programs that we wanted to find a way that we could reach them. And uh, and so we we had a number of planning meetings, and uh, and eventually Annis Carter from Social Impact Studios joined us, and she has worked on a number of, of kind of grassroots campaigns, of really getting information out to people. And we realized that was the right voice for us, really the way that we wanted to go, and we talked about uh, slogans that could could stand for what we we meant. And one that we that we uh, came up with was this idea of make time, which suggests uh, both making time to make things, that it's time to make things, uh, and it seemed to get at the heart of, of what we do. And so now we're in the first phase. We launched the campaign in the fall, and we really want to get. The word out to, to places and people who may think, oh, I think I've heard of a place like that, to people who could say, I could go to a place like that. And because our places are both like high quality and egalitarian at the same time, you know, we feel that there's an audience of, of people who are interested in the handmade, in slow time, in making, thinking about making and creativity. And, and uh, 
if you think of the people who know about us as being one kind of bandwidth, I guess, uh, is the idea would be to just widen that bandwidth and get to those communities who wouldn't always think of us, but if they got to these places would be amazed. And I, I, that's really, I think, at the heart of what we've been trying to do. Yeah, and the, really the other thing is that we've really gotten to to know each other so that that uh, we knew each other before, but the more you meet, the easier it is just to pick up the phone and have a conversation with somebody so that instead of it being once a year where you'd say, oh, yeah, I have a program, you have a program, it was more, we, it's just the interaction is much easier now, which just means the, the more you communicate, the better you get along. And, and what's been remarkable is that, you know, we're five, I guess you could see us as competitors, but it, it's actually a remarkable degree of collegiality, and we don't see it as competition. It's really, really that we we're all in different parts of the country, and we offer remarkable experiences, and we just think, you know, we just want to get the word out to people about it. Um, someone on our chat room there was asking about the the financial aid, the scholarships um, that might be on um, on a broader scale instead of a maybe a statewide scale. I don't know which schools have which um, scholarship opportunities, but is, I don't know, do you want to talk about that? Uh, Lindsay, you look like you're ready to. Sure. Um, we don't have any restriction on where you're from for our scholarships as far as like what country you live in. Um, we do have some that are specifically for college students or specifically for a weaving class. Um, it just depends on the specific scholarship, but I think that every single school has a robust um, financial aid uh, package as far as scholarships or whatever they may call it um, that might be different from what we call it. Uh, but we're all very committed to making it affordable to people so that anybody who wants to have a craft school experience has a good shot at making that happen. Um, so I would encourage anybody who's interested to just look on all the different schools' websites. Um, they can start by going through the portal that we've set up, the craftschools.us. Um, once they get there, they can go to any of the, the five schools and they can look at all of the different scholarships and financial aid that's available. Good. That's that. That's really important, and it's nice to have a, a one porthole. Um, here we go. We got Victoria's got that posted there for me. There you go. You can see that. Um, I don't know if you have any comments, Stu, on that on that top topic. If you were able to hear about, um, I, I couldn't hear, but I I was trying to read lips, and I thought she was saying free. Free. <laughs> so anyhow, I think all I know, you know, Haystack has a very generous scholarship program, and I think all the all the programs have have financial aid programs, and uh, there's really, uh, I think, if you have the need and you have a compelling reason to be at, a, at one of the programs, you could get get to that. Um, and the, you know, a number of the programs also have residencies. Haystack just started a residency last yeah. year that's that's a, a two week free, free program. program. And Penland has a has a long term residency program, uh, so and and Aramont does as well. But but I think you know the goal really for all the programs is to provide accessibility. We all provide support for scholarships and and recognize that that it's really important to provide access. And and don't I hope as our because this will be posted this. Um, webinar will be posted on the Fiber Art Now website for years to come. Um, but yes, there are the need for uh, financial aid, but maybe you're somebody who has capacity and might want to include um, a donation or um, you know support for all or just you know one of the local schools. Um, please, if you know someone who might be willing to do that, think about that. I used to do scholarships, uh, in a, I used to raise funds for a scholarships for a community college in the Seattle area and um, we, you know, we would have a wonderful donor and they'd say, okay, I, I really want to make sure when, when I go I leave some money for people who love to plant pink flowers. And it would be this really you know, narrow <laughs> window. But we'd be so excited because there would be a student coming along the ranks that would be interested in 
pink horticulture, I don't know, something. <laughs> so if anybody knows, I'm always like, I always think it's important to make sure um, uh, if there's if you're passionate about uh, a craft and you have the capacity here's a great opportunity to uh, to give back and actually I'm sure with the with the consortium you have all built there's another um, you know a wider um, umbrella way to support that that your schools and that what they're doing the importance they play in our um, across our country that's my pitch. I'm a, I'm a development person on the in my past life. Um, okay, but here's what I want to know. What what are like? And I'll start with Stu again here, since you're listening intently, Stu. Um, what are what are some of the real challenges that craft schools have? What, you know what what makes it difficult to you know maintain? Is it budgetary? Is it you know the facilities keeping them up? Is it um, attracting people, what do you find that the challenges would be? Well, I, I think you know all of, all the programs have facilities that need regular maintenance, so that's always, and you want to keep up with the demands of the of the field too. So if you need to get different kinds of equipment, you need to have that. So you always have to to keep things upgraded. Uh, I think you know none of the programs is about the equipment itself it's really about the idea of working but you need to have equipment that's adequate to, to what you need to do so you know that's always always a challenge providing access with as you mentioned so eloquently with financial aid is you want to make sure that you have the resources so that you can provide opportunities for people so that means pretty regular fundraising if you want to do programs uh, K-Stack has programs for high school kids we always have to raise money for that so those are the kinds of things that you have to make sure that you can, you can uh, not just survive but really thrive as an institution as you need to raise money. And so that's, you know, a challenge. And, and the other thing I think is just in terms of programming is you want to have the most dynamic programming. So you, you want to make sure you're, you're addressing the current needs of the field. You want to make sure you're honoring the past at the same time. You, you're looking to the future too. So I think those are all things that used to keep me up at night. Uh, but <laughs> But not I've anymore. only been I've only <laughs> stepped down for two weeks, so they're not they still keep me up occasionally. But those are, I think the kind of you know those are the kind of the overall challenge of of uh, of the field, and also I think letting people know outside the smaller craft world how important craft is. I think is a ch is a challenge and a and an obligation of the mm. the programs uh, to really to let people know what remarkable. Uh, Learning, research, and creativity is is at at all the schools. Yeah, those are those are good good words, and I'm going to throw it in your court here, Lindsay. Hi, uh, he said that so wonderfully. I, <laughs> I guess I would just add to that that um, when we're trying to reach outside of our small circle of people who are already comfortable with the crafts, um, it's a challenge to break down that intimidation factor. Um, all of the schools are so welcoming and once you're here, you experience that and understand that. But maybe if you're somebody who is not used to coming to these schools or not used to um, any of these different media, it can be intimidating before you have the experience. And so doing outreach events and other things where we can educate the public um, on how inclusive these schools are uh, is really, really important, and that always takes money. They're mostly free outreach events. Uh, we try to reach as much as we can, as many people as we can in the public, young and old, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and help them understand that this way of learning is available, and it's available for anyone who's interested in creative thinking, not just uh, somebody who wants to become a professional artist. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I. I I just know when my Pacific Northwest, um, with the Pilchuck uh, opportunities, um, how, you know, you need a glory hole, you need, you know, the hot shop, you need all this equipment, and blowing glass isn't something for the faint of heart. But when um, when you have an opportunity or a facility in the area that gives you um, a chance to give it a try, oh my goodness, it's just. It's mind expanding. It's exciting. It just brings—I don't know. It was—if I had all the time and money, I'd be, 
I'd be blowing glass all the time. <laughs> it's just it's a great it's really empowering to take a workshop and see yeah. what you're able to do. Um, yeah. Most we have a lot of professional artists that come and take workshops as well, but I'd say that they're usually taking them in studios and in techniques that they aren't familiar with. So we're all on a level playing field here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one that makes it really. Uh, that's what makes these places so valuable. Well, I don't. Uh, I just want to make sure we we champion what what's going on with the craft school experience. Um, Stu, I don't know. Do you want to give us one good last soundbite to promote what the consortium here is is trying to accomplish and inspire us and we'll look at that well, beautiful you know, textile piece there. Sure. I think you know part of. Our approach is it's really a grassroots approach, as as uh, Annis uh, Carter has presented to us. It's really you know one person speaking to another. So I think anybody who's interested in promoting the kinds of programs that we have, it's not just like us getting out in the world, but if people who are listening or hear this, you know, if they know people who would benefit from going. The way people find out about our programs, the major way when we get done with all the other ways of saying how'd you find out about us is word of mouth which means one person said to another, you know, I went to a place and this is what happened, you should go there too. So I think if you know people who should go there, or maybe you're one of those people who says, wait a second, I should go there, give it a try. Uh, it's, a, it's a risky, safe environment. It's the safest risky environment you could have. It's Sounds a place pretty. where you can take a chance, where you can really, uh, really investigate your own creativity. And uh, and for sometimes it, it can be a catalyst that can send you off in in whole new directions. In fact, I think on your website, Elizabeth Bush may have just written something. Mm -hmm. Was that? And Elizabeth yeah. first came to Haystack uh, as a an assistant, a scholarship student in a workshop, and has gone on to do in addition to her quilt work, public art commissions all around the country, and come back to teach. But the catalyst is really. She was working at the Main Arts Commission. She, she and I actually worked together, and she, she took two weeks off and came and took a workshop and was an assistant. And because of that, she realized that's what she needed to do with her life. So she quit her day job and became a full-time artist. Not that we want everybody in the world to quit their day jobs. You know, we need a, another economy, yes, too. my day job. I'm quitting it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, we're all going to quit now. I did, so, you know. Anyhow, I, I think that they're just, they're just really vital and important places to to how people look at learning and creativity. Some good comments are coming in on the sidebar here and um, one woman, Kimberly, says uh, that she was a young mother with a degree in textiles and Haystack was generous enough to offer me a TA position and how that that changed her her life working with Elizabeth Bush. Um, what an honor, boy, what, a, what an opportunity. Um, and Nancy was asking, how did you decide which schools would be part of this consortium? There's so many. Gosh. Yeah. Well, you know, it really, when you look at the grouping, it, there aren't as many that are residential programs. So our, the grouping really were intensive residential programs. Uh, and there are really, um, there are a few more than, than the grouping, but not that many around the country. And we're the ones who did the work and were interested in doing it and pursuing it. So, you know, it may grow beyond that, but it seemed that, that we all shared uh, a common uh, mission, in a sense, of uh, the, the residential community building part plus the creative making part. Um. Rebecca is asking, what are the schools? Rebecca, if you click on that, or maybe Victoria can put up that uh, picture of the website again. Um, if you click on that green button at the top of our, our you know, numbers bar there, it talks about craftschool.us. There we go. Those are the ones that are have formed now. And uh, I was really excited when I saw that go through my Facebook feed one day. <laughs> it was like October or something when you guys were all at SOFA uh, up and up and and it was like, whoa, what a brilliant, uh, brilliant idea because uh, as a as a group it's much stronger. Okay, well I thank you all for being part of this. Thank you uh, friends for signing into our webinars. I know it's a little bit out of the box for people who are mostly in the 
craft world, but I'm all about craft and technology. I get really excited when the two collide <laughs> somehow. <laughs> so um, thank you, Lindsay. You really appreciate your taking so much time helping us with this conversation. And Stu, thank you very much. And I am, you know, we're going to be posting this uh, on our, well, of course, this recording will go on our website forever. Um, but please share the information with uh, your social media, your friends, and most importantly, your word of mouth. <laughs> okay. Thank Thanks, you very Kami. much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.